Hey, let's start the show for Thursday, September 16th, 2021. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast this week. We are back with another dual cast of a different flavor, we'll call it. Last week, Kishore and I talked about all things Matrix and performance capture. And this week, you know what? We'll still talk about some Matrix and some performance capture because I got Jeremy Williams here. Hey, Jeremy. What's up, Norm? How you doing? Oh, doing all right. I feel like it's uh, it's, as we're recording this, it is Wednesday morning after election day Mm -hmm. here in California. I feel like even though I haven't, I don't drink. I feel like I'm waking up from a big hangover, a political hangover from from all the machinations of the, quite frankly, garbage recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too easy, too easy to to do a recall. But they're talking about perhaps changing that. We will see. We will see. Uh, yeah, we're not a politics podcast though. But we're just giving you the insight of what's in our minds uh, this past week. How has it been these past two weeks for you? Uh, we missed you last week. Oh my gosh. Um, it's been great. It's been great. Um, yeah. Um, what to say? I mean, uh, I, <laughs> you, what do you want to talk about? Well, let's talk about something that we, uh, I wish you were here last week to talk about first, which is still relevant. It still has not come out yet. We're talking about Matrix 4 Resurrections. I have even more thoughts now. I've been on the Reddit threads, but I want to hear your thoughts on the Matrix trailer because. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, we first met, I believe, in 2000. So I was right after, I guess, the first Matrix come out. Yeah. But the same era. I want to, I want to get, put us in a time capsule and take us back 21 years ago to the year, <laughs> to the year 1999, and how you, what the Matrix meant to you then, and what this trailer, presumably you've watched it, means to you now. Oh my gosh, <clears throat> I, I. I remember seeing The Matrix at the Kabuki 8 Theater in, in Japantown, and I remember going into it not knowing anything. And I don't know why I didn't know anything, because there must have been trailers. There must have been some reason I went to see this movie. But I went in, and I remember walking out, and I remember thinking for the first time in my young life, they finally made a movie as good as Star Wars. Like, I <laughs> loved that movie so much and of course it became like the dvd killer app and it was like the the movie that we watched as many times as as i did star wars you know when i was young we just kept i kept watching it watching it love the movie um and then of course the sequels happened right so i I wasn't i wasn't as into no 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 we're not going to do any kind of defense of the sequels but but we can (laughs) talk about at least uh, i think the legacy of those movies oh boy uh are are more than just the the impact of like the, the storytelling and the visuals themselves. Certainly, it's groundbreaking innovation, right? Like in terms of special effects, the invention and implementation of bullet time. Um, that the, well, that was the first one, right? Was, and, yeah, and, right, yeah. And when they and I think they were, you know, they had some constraints, some budgetary constraints, perhaps around using computers, and that, that so they had to rely on on traditional, you know photography cameras hardware things like that and experimental techniques and i think that serves them well and that just in the same way that uh you know that that then those movies when they had a lot bigger budget for the sequels they came out they had uh and they were in the same era of computer graphics as the star wars prequels like it just wasn't a good time for that it wasn't uh you know obviously like jurassic park pulled it off you know eight years or whatever six seven years earlier um but they leaned into it too hard for those movies, and I and I was I didn't care for it. And plus, the fiction lost me. Um, so I, I'm I'm sort of I I was not looking forward to this trailer as much as I was, you know, maybe some other movies like let's say like a new Marvel trailer, or what have you, because this is clearly a an amazing line of success. But I was blown away. I love this trailer. It's a great trailer. It like it just nailed it for me. And and I was watching a. You know, here's 45 Easter eggs in the Matrix trailer <laughs> thing on YouTube, and I clearly missed every one of them. Like, there's yeah. so much in there, um, yeah. and so I guess my question is: Are they going to be able to make a movie? Is this going to be a movie in the same way that like Pixar makes movies for kids and adults? There's like almost two layers, mm-hmm. right? Or the Marvel films they make movies for the Marvel fans and the casual fans. Is this movie going to work? Is it going to resonate for 
people who are <laughs> who liked the Matrix sequels and people who didn't? Like, is it gonna be is it gonna be a Matrix film for all? We'll see. I I would even go a step further and say, is this a film that can work for people who grew up with the Matrix, like you and I, yeah, or right. people who are under twenty years old, Fine. who are not alive when that came out, and will have only seen it on streaming and only seen it in the wake of its legacy, in the wake of special effects, right? Like who do not? It's it's very Star Wars in that regard. In yeah. That it, you know, it's it's only twenty years, but it's I guess it was like about twenty some odd years between Star Wars and the the prequel trilogy, so it has that same. Um, you know, come back and, and re revisiting a, a long thought to be concluded trilogy. That's true. Um, I'll even go, uh, I was thinking about, you know, sitting in the theater, watching the first Matrix with my dad and and thinking about, because uh, Sean and I reviewed Shang-Chi last week and obviously, you know, there's a lot to say about the uh, the uh, importance of Shang-Chi uh, culturally and in terms of representation. But with the Matrix, that was a movie that my parents were incredibly interested, even as a rated R film, in me and my brothers watching, even though we weren't 18 at the time, because even though it was you know a Western cast and a Western filmmakers, it was one of the first films that the action choreographer was a legendary Chinese choreographer director, Yuan Wu Ping, who if you watch like the breakdowns on YouTube, a lot of the fight scenes in the matrix and the sequels are the same choreography that he took from his Hong Kong films. Like literally Jet Li fights are using the same beat by beats because at that point, Western audiences would never have been exposed or most of them would never have been exposed to that kind of fighting. And then you combine that with, you know, the, 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 the the goth style and the dark sunglasses and the, the techno and and it becomes this, this weird fusion. But right. um, it was a movie that like we were we were encouraged to watch because it was at least from a representation standpoint, it was the action rep being represented to that's Western awesome. Audience. That's awesome. Yeah. And obviously, like it's you know it's a old story now, but like the Matrix was hardly rated R. Like it was only rated <laughs> R for a little tiny little bit. I think it was yeah. like the baby scene, and it was like that's why the, the ratings board, you know tip the scales but it, i could imagine a lot of parents being into that and seeing it with their kids absolutely but that absolutely the, those that martial arts choreography man i mean it was not something that i'd been exposed to and it was it wasn't just the choreography it was the way it was shot it was that that it let the choreography play out it, it, those long wide shots without cuts i mean it's just i i can't stand action sequences that are just cut 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 because you, it's like yeah the editing is giving me a sense of kinetic action and you know some sort of pacing but i just want to see it i want to see it like i want to see people performing and in the matrix film especially that first one when it was real people doing them even if they were attached to wires sometimes it was an amazing amazing film i look forward to seeing what they do this time around and this time around you know it's like yeah i feel like they can lean into technology as heavily as they wanted to with the sequels you know we're, we're now at, at an age where obviously marvel has shown and star wars has shown that that can be done successfully and in, i don't know if it was mentioned in that video you watched about the, all the easter eggs but there have been um like i don't know if leaks or people have frankly talked about or talk frankly about uh some of the the direction of this new matrix obviously if you've seen the trailer it's neo not knowing he's neo yeah you know, trinity not knowing there's trinity but there's a uh, supposedly a extra layer of uh, if you look at one of the screen grabs neo is fighting in a room where there's a projector and they're watching the matrix what like the movie the matrix <laughs> is in the film and so there's a almost a black mirror esque additional layer of yeah. like the, the 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 world they've created the film exists in that world yeah and uh the jonathan groff character the very last piece of dialogue is oh we want to go back to the beginning to the matrix he's referring i think to the film not to the idea of them being plugged into the computer uh and it's been theorized that he is keanu reeves neo's talent agent He's an he's his agent, like in the film. Weird. So that's something that I'm not sure how fans of the Matrix will and or even you know will will uh, we'll take in, but we'll see. It comes out at the end of this year. So uh, I was very reassured by the action, but from the glimpses of action that we saw here, you know, it, lots of familiar scenes 
that we saw from, uh, you know, recreations of scenes from the first film, but shot in new ways. And, you know, it looks gorgeous. Uh, the cinematography looks amazing. Um, so I can't wait. This is one where I definitely want to watch in theaters. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, it all, it's going to be the first Matrix film directed by only one of the Wachowskis. And I'll, I'm curious, like, how, once I see it, if there'll be something distinct about it that's, like, clearly, mm -hmm. like, you'll be able to tell that somehow or, or not. And I wonder, that's one element that, that has piqued my curiosity. I'm curious how that's going to play out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last week, Kishore and I also went at length about the ABBA reunion, neither of us being massive ABBA fans, but from a technology standpoint, interesting because uh, they're partnering with, they have partnered with, with ILM uh, to digitally capture their performance and then put on a live stage show with projected holograms for a paying arena, um, which is something that we haven't really seen as a, as a, uh, as a, 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 a like built in, not just a sp one time special event, right. but as a residency for did, this facility. Wait a minute. Did you say you're an avid ABBA no, no, fan? No, no, no. Neither of us are ABBA Oh, okay. Sorry. ABBA I fans. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting from the technology standpoint, but I wanted to follow up on that story because uh, just this past week, we also saw first glimpses of a TV show called Alter Ego. Now it's a singing competition show from the, the makers of, um, like the the what's that popular one mass singer right mass singer is this phenomenon it, I, I, it's 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 neither of our jams jeremy i see that on your face uh but if, in case you're unaware it's a singing competition on fox where they get celebrities of various degrees of fame who do l singing like s s you know it's a comp singing competition show dancing on stage for judges oh yeah but they wear elaborate and increasingly elaborate characters and costumes so it's like furry cosplay mashup with a singing show and right. there's always a big reveal of like oh my god this was this athlete who was actually the mass singer or the celebrity on this one show you remember you know or another singer who you know and then it's you know it becomes a big guessing game between the the, the judges yeah but apparently it's it's, it's phenomenally popular in the US and the same creators have now created a follow up singing competition show except this time it's not celebrity contestants it's just regular people who can sing but they're performing for the judges in hologram form this what is 100% percent tapping into the avatar uh, uh um, idol technology that people are using on YouTube they're wearing Performance capture and motion capture. Performance capture for the face. So you have camera. They're wearing the avatar rigs. You know, okay. from the movie Avatar, the James Cameron rigs with the the tracking markers on their bodies, with a camera on a a, a rig looking at their face. Uh, I presume tracking markers on their face as well and headgear essentially, and they're doing their performances. I think in real time backstage. And being rendered for the judges, so they'll composite it somehow with some, you know, augmented reality technology for the audience to watch at home. Right? We'll see the hologram on a virtual stage. That's easy to composite in, but I assume the judges will be watching a screen and watching a character, a like video game character, perform a song, uh, and then meet the performer eventually at some point. <laughs> I guess I highly doubt it'll be done in real time because that's really yeah just because it doesn't need to be and if I it's you know I've been I have glanced at these reality tv shows Norm I have watched them from time to time and the amount of editing that is done in these things that is made to look like it all happened in real time it didn't like there's all kinds of reaction shots that are just inserted left and right time and again and there's there's so much involved in, in pulling that off real time. Why do it when it doesn't need to be for the sake of a televised show like this? So you're th thinking that even interaction between the contestant and judges, like an interview or something, which I think would be it's shown to still be done with the avatars. Yeah. That's maybe, maybe it's like a lower fidelity rendering. Yeah. In real I, time. That, and then they, Yeah. That I could imagine, maybe they'll try that. But I mean, the performance stuff. There's so much, le so much on that. I don't know. Maybe you're right. That would be neat. That'd be cool. But yeah, interesting. I don't know. But that's not holograms. 
That's, well, that's that's performance capture, but it's it's yeah. it's it's the commoditization of the same technologies that we've seen that were previously at only expensive sound stages. You had to have these boutique, you know, companies, and and they were, none of it was done in real time. Right, it was all right. uh, tweaked and polished by animators. Uh, and honestly, some of it can be very janky. You know, the IK models to do it in real time, you'll have like inverted bent elbows. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And and you know, drooping meshes and stuff like that. Yeah, Will uh, Smith could talk about that uh, exactly. Today. Right. So so maybe it's like the the real time version and like i i didn't think that galaxy's edge smugglers run would be done in real time and they did that in real time so i am not going to underestimate the power of rendering and compute <laughs> to do a thing like this in real time but i do I, I take your point that you know what the viewers will eventually see at home could have an extra layer of polish and animation fix, you know, to, to make it look extra spectacular because uh, there's a lot of editing tricks well, going on. Clearly, they're going to make it look like they're performing on stage and no one's yeah. going to see that. And and yeah. when you said it's holograms, like that's what I was expecting. Like we've seen stage performances, like you mentioned, where people have been projected on stage who aren't actually there. And that's that's what I thought we were you were talking about. Well, the but, ABBA one is that. that right. The ABBA one will be, you know, for the whatever 10,000 person arena, from a distance, right? You don't need to be the fidelity of a of a IMAX screen. If you have, if you're in the nosebleeds, it's gonna look fine. It's gonna look real, even however they do the the projection. <laughs> it's gonna look and, real. <laughs> well, right. they also talked about you know combining it. They're gonna mask a lot of that performance, the the holographic performance, with light design, because the performers on stage are light projected on glass or whatever it is. Uh, but if they have extra volumetric lighting effects, which just means lasers and light with fog and, and, and atmosphere, yep. um, you add, you can, you can trick the audience into believing, Oh, this is just the, the production design of the show. And, and, um, we speculated last week, could there be people who pay tickets to go to the show or are brought to the show and not realize it's not real people throughout the entire, and w- would that matter? Like, like me Kenny with Ballard. the first Lego movie. <laughs> like you with the first Lego movie. <laughs> that part of me wishes we never told you that. Yeah. Let's, you, let's you believe that for years on end. Wow, these keep on getting – they just have more and more Lego. How many Lego pieces did they make to make that movie? You know, though, like the more I think about – like what is this show called? This new uh, – Alter Ego. Alter Ego. Like there's going to have to be an audience in the theater. What That's are they the easiest seeing? thing to fake. That's what the are, easiest. What, but what do they see? Are they watching screens too? I bet they'll just bring down a big projector or have a projector on uh, screen on stage oh, and, do, and just project project the animation out, right? Or they're not going to. They're not going to want to show with that AR glasses. They're not going to want to show the audience watching a movie. The, the, they can fake. That's that's the movie magic part. I Give us a reaction. So. Smile. So. Clap. Clap along. You know yeah. the the power. Just like with the Abba thing, the power of music. If it's a familiar song, right, gets people into the groove no matter what. Like they're watching a music video at that point, and the energy in the crowd. As long as they have enough, you know the 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 the, um, the producers have someone you know riling up the crowd uh, and getting the audience excited. Yeah, all they need is a is a good reaction shot. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about two more things before we get to the Apple event. Uh, there was also the release of the F- Hawkeye trailer that's coming out on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, what do you think 24th. of this? Are you excited for this? This is a I'm, different tone. It's such a different, very surprising. So uh, this is based off of Mac Fash and Matt Fraction's uh, Hawkeye run, in which he like is a landlord in New York and runs into the new, the new Kate Bishop Hawkeye. It's very, very much a lighter tone. It's a Christmas theme series, which I think for me, uh, very surprising. You look at the tone of WandaVision, you look at the tone of Fal- uh, Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Loki. Those are series. dramatic. Those are yeah. dramatic series. This is a, this is a buddy comedy. Yeah. This is, this is Home Alone. Is Home right. Alone 2 lost in New York? I got That's, like Christopher Columbus vibes. I was thinking Die Hard, but you're right. This is more Home Alone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, this is just a this s- is, fun and silly but with some peril. Exactly. Uh, right? Yeah. right? Right. It's exactly it. They're, 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 they're in New York, like fighting off uh, some thugs and shenanigans, and it's not the world at stake. And it's Hawkeye with his family trying to do the Flintstone juggling between his family <laughs> life and this new, yeah. and this new uh, young Kate Bishop. I th- uh, I had heard from the comics at some point somebody planted it in my ear that Hawkeye's daughter becomes Hawkeye. Is that not a thing that ever happened? It's not a thing that ever happened. I oh, think okay. the, that came out of the speculation at the end of beginning of Endgame. 
the scene where you see Hawkeye losing his family and he's yeah. shooting an arrow with his daughter. Um, and but they've they've cast a you know uh, Haley Steinfeld uh, Seinfeld as um, as Kate Bishop, right? And so she will carry the mantle, and presumably Jerry, Jeremy Renner can pop in as he's needed or as he wants, and hmm. doesn't have to carry uh, that load of, of the character anymore. He's, his story kind of wraps up here. Yeah, uh, there's a appearance in the trailer of they're they're watching a musical in New York, Rogers the musical. So mm-hmm. a lot of tongue in cheek stuff. You know, it's still kind of having it tied into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, but yeah, tonally, it's very, very lighthearted. Yeah, I'm actually kind of, the more I think about it, <clears throat> this might be a movie that I, I don't know if, if my 14-year-old will be into as much because he he was like, if it's not rated R, I'm not signing up for this dad. You know, he's kind of like at that stage where he just wants the the grit and the, the edginess. But my 11-year-old daughter, like this might be a Marvel film she get into. Like it's got female protagonists and it's a little lighthearted and fun and Christmas. So hey, maybe this is going to be a winner for younger audiences. We'll see. Well, this is a TV show, so yeah, it's a TV show, not not movie. I guess well, it's it's a a, a movie and told in in multiple parts. Uh, but yeah, uh, the fact that they filmed on location in New York looks like they filmed on location in New York. Yeah, that will be interesting. I think there were reports yet. They did film like they definitely filmed some stuff in New York. You see subway stuff. You see Broadway. I'm sure a bunch of it was also filmed in Atlanta. And Atlanta has not always been the best fake New York <laughs> in, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, so hopefully it feels more like New York this time. I don't suppose yeah. we know how many episodes yet. I I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I mean, if it starts on November 24th, it starts right at Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's got to culminate right around Christmas. I, I it, they must have timed it. So that people are watching a penultimate episode or something, you know, Christmas week. I haven't asked you about what if. Do you, have you been watching what if? Do you, are you enjoying it? Yeah, uh, less invested in it certainly yeah. than the MCU film. But it's well, just, it's just like a Twilight Zone or something, on. right? Because you you never know what you're gonna get. It's like it's not like it's there's a, a cliffhanger. Of yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's not. It's not a cliffhanger. You know, serialized show like every other Marvel series, which I I like. I like that aspect, and uh, I think it's great. I think every every one has has been. I mean, they've they've also varied in tone. Like the first couple were fun, and then they got a little dark. Uh, and I, so I'm curious to see where they're gonna go with each one. But I I mean, I just love seeing Chadwick hearing chadwick again and uh it's oh that it's, was one of my favorite episodes the the black panther the black Ra- panther ravager one. one that i think yeah. is the best one so far yeah uh yeah and even the the last episode which is marvel zombies or there was one that came out last night but we haven't watched it yet uh the marvel zombies one was a serious tone there's deaths everywhere but they still it's funny keep it really light and yeah. funny um which tells you this is not you know this is not canonical this is just like mm. watching a cartoon the animation's fantastic I think whatever they're doing with the animation, they're they had money to put it in there. For sure. But I think half an hour is too short for some of these stories. It goes by way too quickly. It <laughs> feels like they, they expect you to know the characters and a lot of it's just like, oh, this character's here. Oh, that character's there. Um it's a lot of inside jokes for MCU fans, but you don't get a lot of character development, which is why I like the the Black Panther one, because that one I felt like there was good character development for him. Yeah, my favorite too. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, the uh, one more story before the big Apple event, quote unquote, big Apple event. Uh, tonight we have the launch of Inspiration Four. This is the private space flight booked via SpaceX. So it's the the vehicles and everything is SpaceX, but the crew of four are all private citizens without any. You know, military or any uh, government association. So this is uh, entrepreneur. Uh, what is it? Jason. What was his name? Jason. Jared. Jared Isaacman. Jared Isaacman, who did a whole contest. They had applications. It's all to raise money for St. Jude's Hospital. So the goal is to raise, you know. $200 million in, in awareness for pediatric cancer research. Uh, there's going to be a whole Netflix show about this, but the launch is tonight at 5 p.m. out of Florida, out of um, uh, Kennedy. And how, have you seen like the, the images and it's been on like the cover of Time Magazine? They've been, there's been like tons of, you know, YouTube content around it. Have you seen on this stuff, Jeremy? I mean, I ha- no, I haven't seen the YouTube content. I've seen some images. I mean, 
you know, it's exciting. It's it's also a little little weird. The the interesting thing about the mission, I'm sure all of this will be a kind of really further ex- explored and explained in the Netflix movie or show that's coming out of it, uh, is it's going to be multiple days. So I think what is it? Three days. Uh, three days in space. What? So they're not going to ISS. It's not just like the Richard Branson or you know that that flight of the Jeff Bezos flight where they go up, you know, float a little bit and come back down. They're going up. Staying for three days and then returning back to Earth. Uh, and it's on the Dragon capsule, which previously they would have a, a docking hatch for the ISS. Yeah. They're not going to ISS this time. So that docking hatch has been replaced with a, uh, a cupola, a, uh, a viewing dome. So they get to, you know, observe <laughs> oh the Earth. God. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be fascinating because that, that's a lot of time. I, I, I don't think it's as cramped as what like shuttle was shuttle. You know, they had four crew members and that was, and the, it, it was smaller than a bathroom, right. For, for people to live on the shuttle cockpit for a couple of days as it went up to, up to ISS. But, uh, here, I mean, it's still pretty cramped. The dragon capsule. So it's four people total. Yep. There isn't a SpaceX representative or an astronaut on board to lead the mission. There's just Correct. four civilians. That's interesting. Yes. Now the four civilians they have like some some expertise. Like these aren't just like four people they pick. Three people they pick. It's it's the guy, the the rich guy, right? The uh, uh, Jared Isaac man, and then there's uh, a geoscientist entrepreneur train, who's a trained pilot. Um, uh, there's a physician assistant and an aerospace data engineer. So they're smart people. They've been trained. I mean, SpaceX has always talked about their Dragon capsule being basically able to fly an autopilot right. right they've designed it so you can press the button and everyone you know the, the they're not going far enough away that the engineers on the ground aren't can't remotely control it, right with, with just a little bit of latency right and, and elon has said that you can't you can't control rockets they've had their best people and it's just the amount of latency is for the brain to register and, and or, you know deliver input is too much yeah. and that they yeah. the computers have to do it all yeah, they're not doing any like maneuvers or anything. It literally is a pre-programmed route and flight, uh, and, and should be automatic. You know, and weather looks fine. Uh, and so we'll watch the launch today at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, assuming no delays, and then be able to follow that over the next three days, which is going to be super exciting. That's awesome. Hey everyone, Norm here. Before we continue, I want to let you know that this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from ITPro.tv. Start or grow your IT career with online IT training from ITPro.tv. Did the recent ransomware attack on the gas pipeline catch your attention? It's another example of how cybersecurity professionals are in demand. There are more than 500,000 open cybersecurity roles, and you can become a cybersec pro with online training. It's never too late to start a career in IT or move up the ladder, and ITPro.tv has you covered, from CompTIA and Cisco to EC Council and Microsoft. ITPro.tv has nearly 6,000 and hours of on-demand training and engaging hosts who present who present information in a talk show format. They're live every day and shows go stew to the web in 24 hours. Courses are conveniently listed by category, certification, and job role, and stream ITPro.tv courses live and on-demand worldwide via Roku, Apple TV, PC, or their iOS and Android apps. Learn IT pass your certs, and get a great job with itpro.tv. Visit itpro.tv slash test to save 30% off all plans. That's itpro.tv slash test. Once again, itpro.tv slash test. Now back to the show. And then finally, the big thing this week, saving it for last, is there was the Apple event. I don't know about you, Maybe it's because of how long we've been in lockdown, pandemic. I know there was new, new, there were new iPhones last year, but this is like the, one of the first times where I just did not care for the event even ahead of the event. Like I was not excited for there to be an Apple event and for there to even to hear about new iPhones. Like my brain wasn't didn't feel like it was ready for new iPhones. Yeah, I don't um. I was I was probably as excited as I've been in past years, which is like, you know, 
the week beforehand, I'll realize there's an Apple event and I'll have it on my calendar and I'll look forward to it. And I'll like that morning, I'll watch it. But that's not to say it was an exciting event. It was it was pretty lackluster. I would say it was not the most exciting Apple event in recent history, for sure. Um, the one thing I wanted was the new iPad mini, though, and I was glad to see that <laughs> announced. And uh, I have that on order and I'm excited to get it. That's great. So, my my iPad mini is six years old. So oh, I'm, wow. And you're, you still prefer mini size, mini versus standard oh, yeah. versus pro. Me, yep. the, the, uh, apparently the, the, me the and pro. me and me and nurses, we prefer the mini. That's what uh, Apple said. I'm so let's run excited. down. Let's let's run and the students also. Students could could really like that because it sure. works with the, the pen. So let's run down the announcements and then also talk about what the expectations were and what we did not see uh, that people were hoping to see. So you're right, let off with iPads. So two new iPads. There's a new entry level iPad, like the three hundred odd some odd dollar one. Uh, that one has a A13 processor, so it's two generations back. Still plenty fast. That's that's the one on the iPad I currently have, the iPad Pro I currently have, which is super fast. Um, but it now also runs the A15. This is the first on the five nanometer process, I believe. Tiny. So long battery life. Uh, and that's the iPad mini uh, that's for 500 bucks. Um, it has touch ID. So it has that finger touch ID on the side button, the power button, no big button in the front. Do you have any you know, devices that use that? No, I don't. I'm my, curious. my iPad has Face ID, and I don't like it. I always end up using the the code. It's always yeah a little bit of a delay to to have it unlocked. I like Touch and, ID. I just wonder since it's left surface area, if it's uh, as quick yeah. as effective. Blah blah blah. We'll see. I bet it's just machine learning. Like yeah. they, you know, they, they've just, over time it trains to be better and better and better. And it's it's not biometric security for like you know, it's not to, it's a deterrent more than it is. Right. A, a real gate or a big uh, you know a big vault yeah uh and then uh you know has the bezels has you know pen input the apple pencil input it works with gen 2 with a magnetic pencil on the side and yeah 500 bucks uh you get the what, what capacity i guess is a good question for ipad mini uh i got the big one what why would you need the big one <laughs> that's the one where i feel like <laughs> ipad I, I messed up cancel messed the order <laughs> <laughs> I feel like iPad is the place where you don't need the storage because if you look at – it's going to be different for everyone. When I look at storage distribution on my iOS devices, on the phone, vast majority are photos and videos. Videos take up a ton of space at 4K. Yeah. In fact, so much so that I kind of rely on iCloud and things to back it up there. But I don't take pictures on the iPad. I have pictures. The iCloud downloaded. I can, I can download – but nothing is really – captured on those cameras and i don't use those as my primary video filming or photography devices and so it's really just <clears throat> itunes streaming net, streaming media at like some apps i don't feel like i need that capacity you know in retrospect norm i don't need the capacity you're you right you don't need the capacity you're probably Save that right money. you're right but it's such a big difference it's 64 to 256 like i i can't imagine 64 gigabytes anywhere else like that seems small and it was That's, like, so that's what, that was that. That's they, what I did. They, they, they've, yeah. 64 is unacceptable as a, as a device. And Apple knows it too. The, and they know that difference. Is it 100 bucks between 64 and 256? 150. 150. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, For a $500 device? Well, you're really making oh. me feel it. Oh, well. Wow. That's. <laughs> Boo, Apple. They should have started at 128. In fact, they started at 128 for the iPhones. Yeah. So the iPhone 13, is this the second time now that there's no S? They went from you know 10, Thank 10S. Goodness. Too much. 11, 12, yep. and now no S straight right. to 13. Uh, the surprise, I guess, here is they kept the mini. So mini, 13, Pro, Pro Max. Four phones. Uh, you can divide them right between the pro and the non-pros. Let's start with the non-pros. The mini seems to be more attractive this time around because longer battery life and it has good cameras. Both the mini and the regular 13 have two cameras, the ultra wide as well as uh, the standard wide. They lose the telephoto. Turns out no one telephoto, not really that useful. If you're on the fence between the pro and the non-pro, this is the year to really get, I think, the non-pro, the 13 or the 13 mini. I think the 13 mini, I know it won't be popular, it won't sell well, because people like big screens, but I think the 13 mini 
is the one for people is a great if, if the battery life is as good as they say because of the new process and the cameras are they have the good wide angle and the better ultra wide with the the mi- macro uh the mini might be the one to get you think time. people who are <clears throat> thinking about getting the mini really are making the decision based on the quality of the camera like to me like no. people People are getting the mini. That that's the form factor thing, and that's that's what matters. And they all the phones take fine photos, so that they don't even think about that. Well, the mini previously you bought it because of the form factor, and it was cheaper, cheaper, right? Form factor, but the trade offs were much shorter battery life, and the camera was not as good because you lose the pro yeah. camera. You get the better camera that the iPhone, like the 12 Max, had last year. You get that camera with the mini this time, so you don't compromise there. And if the battery life is increased it, and it's cheaper, it's a win-win. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, I think that the cameras on the regular iPhone line this year are fantastic. Yeah. It's great. And it tells you how, because of the reports of how poorly the Mini had been selling the last year, mm. it's surprising they didn't kill it off, but they have aggressively designed it to feel less of a compromise to entice more people to buy it. So it may it might, it might go away next year. I don't I don't know, but it feels like if if there's one year to get it, this is the year to try the mini size for size, uh, and and see if you like it and not feel like you're giving up on image quality or battery life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the uh, the standard standard line. It has new cameras. Uh, a, a big feature for the the new iPhone, if there was an S feature, is video now has a portrait mode <laughs> depth, a computational photography built into video and including rack focus in video. Did you see the demos for this? <clears throat> of course. Yeah. I mean, I first of all, the AI driven rack focus stuff is questionable. Like the that where it watches the subject's gaze and will attempt to focus on things that they look at or people who they look at, I don't trust that for a second to be useful for any kind of actual filmmaking like you're going to want to manually control that and you can and that's all in there and that that's cool um what what i found most interesting is that that whole cinematic mode their whole uh you know depth of field calculation stuff that's a post process so you'll be able to do that later it's it's like you'll be able to apply it, it records a depth map into the video footage somehow and after the fact once you've shot it you can choose where you want your focal point to be so that's the destru- non-destructive s- video editing is what you're talking about. When you film the video yeah. on your I- iPhone 13, it will look flat, or maybe in the preview, it'll, it'll, it'll show the depth of field. But like the Lytro, which was using real light field video right. capture, here, the it's depth very- map will allow you to, to, to change that, much like it was a pro feature, or I guess a iPhone 12 feature only, you can adjust the aperture. Like how much depth of field in your previous portrait mode photos? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I've, certainly, there are third party apps that let, you, that let you do that with the portrait mode stuff, where you can choose how much bokeh you want, what style of bokeh you want, how how blurry do you want it. Um, and that that's really cool. I mean, I, I think that that's going to be extraordinarily useful to people uh, who are who are shooting with the iPhone. Uh, if it looks good. It's, there's a, there was always a, if it looks good and the portrait mode stuff kind of looks good at a glance, but if you scrutinize a little too much, totally, then you like, eh, it feels like you can, you can see the seams. You can and that's see a the, single the, frame, the right? Yeah, like, right. To extrapolate that out to 60 frames a second or whatever, I don't know if you can shoot high frame rate or not in that mode, but like that's, that's impressive. And so I, I am curious to see how that evolves, but so yeah, I, I expect this to be the first generation of it, but to know that this is sort of the what we're going to see evolving going forward, I think, is exciting. They've lent, they've leaned into you know things that look good for people sharing video on social media, right? They want to they, they, they make it pleasing to the eye, and they also find want to find ways to make use of all that processing power they have on the A15. Like Apple's in this place where they continually improve their chips, but we're running out of these killer features on the phone. But they have to continually improve the chips because they, they will need that processing power for AR, yeah, right? Right, and and so like the iPhone really doesn't need all this processing power. That extra battery life would be would be great. But here's a feature that can tap into that uh, because they've developed a 15. I guess my my only question is like, really, how many people will care about this? Like most of the people shooting iPhone video are never going to n- use this feature, and they're never going to control even where the focus like focuses beyond starting the video. They might open it up and tap on their 
you know, their subject, but that's it. They're never going to, after they have shot, go back and adjust the depth of field. So this really was, and you saw it numerous times in the pr presentation geared towards professional video, you know, producers. And I, I, just, I mean, that's not, that's not a market that is going to, you know, make the iPhone sales sink or swim. That's weird. Uh, I think there's a. I agree with you completely, and there's a great analog with the Pro Raw feature from the last generation's iPhone. Yeah, I I do think that perceptual from from perception standpoint, someone it justifies someone spending the money, and certainly we're we've been guilty of this of wanting to get the new device because it has the checkbox feature and want to try it out. Yeah, but ends up being not something we've used. So mm -hmm. I, I agree that I don't think a lot of normal casual users will make use of this unless you know it becomes a big thing on TikTok or Instagram and it becomes a, like a visual trend. Yeah. Uh, but they're going to walk into a store and say, "Ooh, I can do portrait mode video." There'll be a line, you know, in the feature set and make it feel like they're getting the value I guess. for upgrading their phone. I mean, it's the same thing with the, the Pro Raw stuff, the photos. I use that a lot. I love Pro Raw. Really? With photos, I import in Lightroom. I think Apple has done a terrible job of uh, giving users, casual users, the ability to tweak those photos and really maximize the quality because the Photos app, where you can you know, put in your filters or you can adjust some of the, the auto settings, they don't tap into any of that stuff. You have to use a third-party photo editing app to make use of the raw pictures. And when you turn on Pro Raw, that toggle, there's no easy. It takes up 25 megabytes of picture, which is massive. Eats up your iCloud, eats up your your phone storage. Wow. Uh, and there's no way to flatten an image easily to say, "Oh, I took a raw picture, but you know what? I'd be happy with the JPEG for the rest of this picture's life." You can't save both. It saves both automatically, but I can't discard the raw right on a, on a whim. Got it, it. Saves as the raw, or I had to delete the picture, or you know, export it as a JPEG in Lightroom and then delete the picture. Right. And it makes it cumbersome. And I don't think Apple cares because they would rather you just eat up the storage because they, they don't want you to think about storage because it all supposedly lives on iCloud and you, they want you right. to pay you know, 20 bucks a month for that storage. Well, this year they announced ProRes as a format you can shoot video in, which is going to be the video equivalent of what you just described, which explains why the phones now come in one terabyte. Yeah. So this is interesting. This is the Pro-only feature. The, the two big distinguish, distinguishing features... I guess three, if you're looking at the Pro and the Pro Max, is the screens are now 120 hertz, finally. I think that is a, a measurable using difference on the iPhone or on the iPad Pro. It is something I notice every single time. I believe how it. smooth it is from, from 60 to, to 120. And it's dynamic, uh, right? So it's supposed to adjust what refresh rate you need at the time. So obviously, if yeah. you're playing a game, it'll be 120 the whole time, optionally. But if you're what, browsing the web, the web and it's a static you know, screen, it's not going to eat up your battery power. So it lowers the refresh rate. That's cool. But the moment you scroll yeah. down a Twitter feed, a web page, it's going to be smooth. I, I uh, believe and, that's a, that, that's a good experience. And I, and I would like to have that. I, on the Android phones I've used, it's been, it's, it, it's a night and day difference in, in the smoothness of even the UIs going between the home screen icons uh, and how smooth 120 Hertz gets you. So that's a great feature. Uh, telephoto goes 3X optical now. Right. Again, this is pro only the pro models have the telephoto. I don't like or I don't use the telephoto. Really? Uh, I never like, use it. Come on. Like never. you're out in the world, you, you might zoom, never. maybe not. No? But also because does, it also does night mode now. Oh that I mean, uh, sure. If you're night mode plus telephoto, even it's subset of a subset. <laughs> uh, and I, I can't imagine the scenario that I want to glimpse something, you know. Uh, far distance away at night and hold something steady. You know, I, you know, wide angle at night makes more sense than telephoto at night, in my mind. The landscapes, cityscapes, that kind of stuff. You know, the, the, uh, they made a big point of all the cameras across the line doing better low light now. And I, and I will, because bigger sensor, and, and it, I, I will be curious if, like, the shot you shared recently of your son sleeping, which was mm -hmm. a, an amazing shot, you used your watch to. Well, I, I can tell you exactly how I did it. Okay. I, I, he was asleep. Yeah. So you can look at my Twitter. I'll, I'll put this maybe a link to this. Uh, we're trying to get our son to sleep in a real bed. It's been a it's been a struggle. So it's a victory. It feels very victorious when he actually does it. So two nights ago, he fell asleep in the bed. I was sitting next to him. Finally, it took you know twenty minutes. He was passed out, 
And so it's, as I went to check on him, it's a pitch black room. He has like a night light across the room that barely lights up. I wanted to get a photo of him to share with Danica. And I took a photo with my phone using the standard wide angle camera, which has the best low light of the three cameras on this. And it was, it was garbage. Like it was, you could see this yeah. it looked green tinted, you noisy, could, it was yeah. noise, super noisy. You could, you could even get focus. And so I said, okay, I needed to put some light in this. And I was wearing my Apple watch. And so you can turn on the flashlight mode, which just brightens up, a, makes it a white screen on the watch. And I held it across my chest and then held the phone over him and then scrolled to use night mode, which you can is a long exposure, and maximize the time, which it's dynamics. Sometimes you can maximize like 10 seconds. Sometimes it's max three seconds. Here is max eight seconds. Turned on raw photo, which is important. You can do night mode plus raw and then held it steady for eight seconds uh, and then did a little post-processing in Lightroom and got it. I thought a pretty great photo. Amazing photo. And so, but so my question is how, where on the spectrum between your version with and without the watch, do the new phones fall without the watch? So uh, with the new phones, I bet it wouldn't be that much better because the night mm. mode gets you the Christmas, the, the night mode, the, the multiple exposures that night modes combines is the equivalent of having a better camera sensor. And so you're, yes, probably it'll, it'll look better. It'll be more, you know, high, higher resolution and, and, and more data packed in, you know, you're getting actual more photons hitting the sensor, but the benefit of these new sensors and the 1.6 aperture of the new wide angle lens is just going to be in your quick snapshot. It's going to be in, in when you're not using night mode, it's going to be when you're out in the city streets and, and getting a, a, a photo of someone or, or something mm. you see in the world. Uh, night mode, I don't think it's going to be that much more improved, but I could be wrong. I, I'd be happy to, I mean, that's a, algorithm that constantly is up, up improving as well. Another feature that I'm actually most excited about, I think between the 120 hertz and this feature, they're the two like most killer apps or killer features of the new phones, and it's the macro photography. So the, the fact that you can now take photos up to two centimeters away from things, that's a limitation. I, I do that a lot. Like I don't know. I, I'm into that. And that I have always been frustrated by the distance I have to be from a subject in order to get a close-up shot of it. And, so uh, this is... Yeah. Only for ultra wide? Um, I I'm not sure. I think I mean, it's only for the ultra wide, which that is makes sense. Yeah, typically been I've been disappointed with the minimum focus distance. One of the things you look at with cameras uh, isn't just the the field of view or the depth of field, the aperture, but also what the minimum focus distance. Anyone who's held a DSLR has 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 had that experience where you try to focus on something. And you can't because you it's can't. too close to the lens. There's actually a physical distance, and it's not a thing that's written on the lens. It's not a feature that tell, it's, it's very clear. You just kind of have to realize it from experience. And with the ultra wide camera on the iPhone Pros and the, on the iPhone last year, the minimum focus system was like multiple feet. So you couldn't get, you lose any ability to. You know, get a really cool animal picture or something because uh, it's just blurry. It's a fixed focus, actually. You can never change the focus. It was always fixed focus. Um, and so I guess this one now has right. multiple degrees of focus for the ultra wide. I'll find myself doing a thing where, where I'll use the telephoto in order to get closer to things, you know, because yeah. I want to move the camera closer, but I just can't. That, that range is useless. But so I, I would very, I would love to have that feature. I'm not getting the phone this year, but I, I, I know you are because you're on the plan. I'm on the upgrade plan. I'm going to wait till next year, I think, just because it's just not enough. I mean, it's just not enough new stuff. But this is one of the things that I'm, I'm looking forward to next year. And going back to the ProRes, this is the new encoding that, you know, the Apple raw equivalent for video, uh, they haven't really released as much specs like to call it ProRes doesn't tell you much aside that you know it's higher you know the different encoding rather than h264 or 265 you're going to have more data you'll you'll need to edit it you know in in um, final cut and premiere can accept ProRes now mm. it's be much bigger files massive files massive so files. they have a limitation because of how big the files are the 128 gigabyte iPhones can only do ProRes at 1080 30 and if you have a 256 gig, 512 gig, or one terabyte size iPhone, you can do ProRes at 4K 30. So literally a software limitation that they've put in to not let you store that much video uh, on, on your 128 entry level. So even within the Pro line, 
there was a difference between the pro line storage capacities. Yeah. I mean, it's neat. Like you saw that one example of <laughs> of somebody shooting iPhone footage in, you know, it was like a war scene and they were covering it with mud and like throwing it through the brush. And they're like, you know, usually these cameras are so precious and people are so careful about them it's interesting to think of like an iphone pro which is not cheap for me you know but but for a cinematographer it is like they, they could buy 10 of these things and take them out in the field and treat them you know not worry about uh how careful they are with them and you know shoot pro res and i'm curious to see I'm, this will be an interesting uh sort of new new barrier i, I, I go back to what you said earlier that this is not going to be a feature that vast majority yeah. of people who buy these phones use right and and i don't think they'll build in even an iMovie on the phone, the ability to really tweak as much. Mm. But for someone, for, for the Steven Soderbergh's out there who love shooting on iPhones, yep. they'll buy their aftermarket moment lenses and shoot anamorphic on their new iPhone Pro 13 Max and, uh, and, and be able to put something that they can publish on Netflix. I think this is the first year where the Max hasn't had an exclusive feature. Too. So like the the cameras have parity across both pro phones, which is which yeah. is great. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really only the size difference between yeah. the Max and and the regular, which I I never been have been a fan of the Max. So Too big. I'm glad to stay with the the Pro, the, the Mini or the Pro. That's that. Those are the ones on on paper. Uh, they go on pre sale this Friday and they'll ship on the 24th. Uh, and there was a new watch, Series Seven watch. Also, not interesting to me. <clears throat> I mean, I'm a few generations back. You've got the always on screen. I don't have that, so it would be nice to catch up. But uh, I don't know. This, it tells me more so than ever that if you had gotten the Gen 4 or 3 or later, the, the first one of this design, yeah. you're good for five years, <laughs> thankfully, because it's a $500 watch that you don't do anything with, right? If you went back 15 years ago and said, here's a $500 watch, yeah, that's a family heirloom. That's something you're going to pass on to your, you know, you're going to keep in a little watch carrier, you're going to put in your your fancy watch drawer. Yeah. But here, 500 at minimum watch that they want you to cycle out every two, three years. I'm not going to do that. It's going to be, it'll be five years. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy with what I got. Don't need cellular on that either. Uh, and uh, so bigger screen, same design, no new form factor as a lot of people expected. Uh, and then the things also that did not appear at this event, no new MacBooks. That was everyone was hoping for a new MacBook Pro with the M1X chip. So presumably another event later on. They want people to not get freaked out about how much money they have to spend this week and next week. So let people buy their iPad minis, their watches, or the new iPhones this month and then and toward the holidays, they'll they'll do another big rush with uh with the the new MacBook Pros, presumably. And despite the <clears throat> invitation and the AR app, no AR. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was kind of hoping for that from the WWDC too, given that that invitation, which actually had you know glasses and reflections in the glasses. Yeah, uh, I and you look at how lackluster this event was, and it goes it just goes back to diminishing returns like we're just it's like what more can you add to a to a phone to make it wow people it's just we're not we're out of things we, you can't make this camera substantially better anymore in a way that that makes people want to buy them and your battery life seems pretty stagnant nobody needs to play faster better games we don't need a faster processor and like so they are running out of steam on phone hype and so i i they've they've got to figure this ar thing out soon because they need to be at the beginning of a new product. Like the iPhone 13 is mature. We, and the best, most interesting thing about the VR space for me has been knowing that it's early days and every generation having market improvements and excitement surrounding re new releases. And so whenever Apple can get around to it, they're going to have to do it and do it fast. Well, I forgot about the invitation that, about WDC that also hinted at glasses i mm. wonder if all the invitations going forward will have some right. cute ar reference until they're ready and then they can say you know we've been putting this in your mind for a while now uh, that's one way to think about it the other way to think about it is because of the announcement and the reception of those ray-ban facebook stories glasses that were announced last week i wonder if it was nixed from the presentation even a, a one more thing teaser oh man i doubt it this is too big a deal you think they're they're happy with they're not looking at 
consumer reaction and public reaction. <laughs> Honestly, but, these phones will probably sell record numbers. Like people can't stop buying iPhones. As, as who knows why like maybe they don't even need to do this anymore and by the way come on can we please get some presentation like savvy this is like watching ai taught robots deliver deliver presentations i can't stand it now i know they're not in front of a live audience and that's got to be a factor here like they've got as many takes as they want they have a director on set saying do it again but it's too rehearsed it's too robotic loosen Jeremy, up you're talking about an infomercial uh, yeah, can we please? Uh, honestly, <laughs> You're like asking too much for an infomercial from the company with Steve Jobs in the DNA. It makes no sense. Can we just go back and learn not just what great products are, but also what great presentation is, please? Thank you. You're, you're, you're feeling the lack. The reality distortion field has 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 shrunken, and you're <laughs> yeah. now outside the boundary, much it's like true. the WandaVision in, influence. You are you're outside of the town. I now. took the red pill. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so that's it for the the big apple, the the the, the mediocre mediocre Apple event uh, this past week. I think there'll be another one before the end of the holidays. Uh, and with AR, uh, I still believe the rumor is that before they put out the AR glasses that they hope will be the mainstream ones, there's going to be a pass through system with you know to, to test their slam out into the world. Because Sean and I talked about this. You know, one of the reasons of the Ray Ban Stories glasses, what they, they exist, is because there's they need to test this stuff in the real world at some point and people will need to, they can't be a stealth product and suddenly come out the way the iPhone and the iPad have been. And two, they need to also change the public perception slowly but surely about wearables uh, in a way that Google Glass really fell on its face. And so far, these Facebook stories glasses have not resonated in the same way. Uh, and I think the best bet for Apple is there is there the AirPods? The way the, the the most convincing argument that they have about getting people to put something on their face to think of as a computer has been the AirPods. No new AirPods either at this yeah, event, right? Yeah, yeah. So wearables, a uh, whole thing going forward. Although watch, I guess watch is a wearable. Um, I think that does it for this week's podcast. Yeah, uh, bunch of stuff to go over. Yeah, well, there's some minor minor stories here. Uh, I'll make oh. a. Oh, yep, yep. No, dude, we got the biggest story of the week. What? Way better than the Apple event. There's Lego. a new new Stern pinball game was announced. <laughs> this is a big deal, though. Okay. Because okay. it's it's Keith Elwin's fourth game. Keith Elwin, you'll recall, is the world's greatest pinball player turned game designer. designer. Yep. Yeah, like, who know, like six years ago, made Iron Maiden, Jurassic Park, Avengers, Inf Infinity. <laughs> something and <laughs> infinity quest i think and and the new game is like his dream his dream game he and he got to make it godzilla and not Which... like the not the new one no 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 like toho like 1950s through like 1980s godzilla and and it incorporates like footage from 10 of the classic godzilla films but it's not black and white like this is a most colorful game you've seen and it's like it's an it's a great, great license because it's not beholden to like, you know, Marvel voices and it's not the artwork I'm sure probably needed to be approved, but it's, it's great. It's awesome. And the shots look really innovative on the uh, premium. There's a tower, there's a building in the center that moves up and down and the balls go through it. And depending on what floor the, the towers on, the ball will be diverted onto various ramps there is a uh, a spinning disc on the right side with stand up targets, and then it spins to reveal a ramp. The ball launches off the ramp and hits a model of Mecha Godzilla with a magnet on his chest who can grab the ball. It looks great. The sound looks cool. The video looks cool. It's like this. I'm obviously no one's played it yet. The reveal video is this Friday, but I haven't been this excited about a pinball game. It's this is not the first Godzilla pinball machine. Is it not? There, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you that. Is that when was the last Godzilla pinball game? I believe there was one based on the Roland, uh, the Emmerich, Roland Emmerich, the, the one with Hank Azaria, that movie. I'm Googling Godzilla pinball machine. <laughs> I'm seeing one with that logo. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Sega I, made that one. That's exactly right. Yeah. With their, with their dot <laughs> I'm a little disappointed. I, I, I trust you in, about the game design and all what are you this, disappointed these, by? the cool toys. The aesthetics. Oh, when you say well, Godzilla, yeah. pinball machine, 
Yeah. I want it to be black and white. I okay. want the, the screen to show clips from Godzilla films. I want the aesthetic not to be like graffiti art Godzilla. I want photos of the man in suit. Of like a rubber, you know, I, I want that aesthetic. Right. I hear you. Yeah, they had the, like a Monsters game a few years back that had a black and white version of it. That I could see that working for this game too. But uh, this, the artwork here was done by my favorite stern artist, uh, Zombie Yeti. His, his name's actually Jeremy. And uh, I, so I, I love this style of art. And I think when they're not, when they can are released to do their own thing, I'm always relieved. I hate when they're or beholden to making things look like movie renders or Photoshop mm. art. Yeah. So this feels like an artist was able to express himself, and so I like that. It's very, I feel like it's very cohesive. And, and you're right, remains to be seen. It does say it features footage from ten movies, so I oh, assume okay. that they are in black and white. And there's even an option to subtitle the Japanese from the movies if you want, or I assume mm. you could just hear the Japanese. Be amazing. Yeah, that, that makes me even, I mean, it feels like right for a mod, maybe, for the toys, to feel more of that era. Oh, right sure. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, three, it's, three editions. It's a green Godzilla. Yeah, no Green no Godzilla. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. In my mind, Godzilla is black and white. <laughs> Godzilla, Godzilla exists in grayscale. Yeah, I'm Godzilla. sure you're right. The, 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 the pinball mod market knows no end to the amount of money it can, uh, you know, spend and receive so you're right i'm sure there will be black and white gods on the mods awesome all right thanks for the pinball update you're welcome uh, there's a big lego update if you haven't seen october 1st a super mario world lego set is out you ever seen this it's a transforming question mark box it's a giant question mark box oh. that's you know maybe 10 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches maybe even bigger uh, but the top part folds out for these micro super mario to on the map of super mario world what yeah but you build it, and that's what you get when you build it? When you build it, you can store it on the shelf as, a, as the question mark box. What? But then the top part folds out to have these little dioramas of the lands in oh. Super Mario World. Oh, sorry. It's Mario 64, not Super Mario. It's Mario 64. Yeah. Wow. Does that look cool? Yeah. $169. I know. October 1st. And 99 yeah. cents. There goes your Lego update and your pinball update. And that does it for us this week. I hope we will be back next week with the full cast and crew. Uh, if you haven't seen on the site, we have our second behind the scenes look at the Ghostbusters Afterlife, uh, visiting the production set and talking to the set decorator that's on the site right now. Uh, and we do have some one day builds coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. But until then, uh, Jeremy, anything, any shout outs, any, any, any things you want to give a shout out to? No, thanks for asking. All right. all right, no shout outs. You can follow Jer Jeremy at Jerware. You can follow me at Enchan, and we're always at Tested.com. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Hi there, I didn't see you. Tested. Uh, I would love to be able to play Racket NX at a VR arcade. That sounds stupid. with wireless. That sounds dumb. What? Yeah, I'm afraid that sounds dumb, Kishore. Tested.